Good morning, and welcome to the online service of the South Baton Rouge Church of Christ. We are so happy you decided to connect with us today. And also, I'm really excited that there is a full crowd here with me. Uh, someone filled this auditorium with smiling faces, so uh, let me show you what I'm looking at. It's great. They're all smiling. Um, their mouths are all wide open in awe, um, but they're not blinking, which is a little disconcerting. But anyway, it's good to have some, some faces in these seats, and I look forward to, to when it's actual people here with us on, on a Sunday morning. Over the next hour today, we're going to spend time worshiping together as real people in our homes. Uh, we're going to spend some time in song, in prayer, in scripture reading, and we're also going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So if you need to prepare some elements to take it home, please do that now. Uh, I'm going to share a message from Acts chapter 21, and uh, at the end we'll have a closing by one of our shepherds. So I want to draw your attention to two things below the video on the church webpage right now. Uh, the first is prayer requests. We would love the opportunity to pray for you. I know there's a lot going on in your lives right now. And so if you just fill out that form, every Tuesday the elders and the staff meet together over a, a web call and we start praying for those things that are sent in. So uh, if you have anything on your mind or on your heart, please, please fill that out uh, so we can pray for you. Also, there's a, a link for giving. There's um, links for online giving. There's an address you can send a check in to the church. Uh, there's ways that you can give through texting even. Um, so if you're, if you're able, we would uh, really appreciate it if you can, can send your contribution into those places. Additionally, we've set up a fund to aid members who are experiencing financial hardship as a result of this virus and the shutdown. So if you would like to give something to help out those members of our family uh, above and beyond your, your regular contribution, uh, please indicate that on, on your check or uh, in the drop-down box uh, that indicates the direction you'd like your check to go to on the online contribution. Uh, it was great last week seeing some of your faces in the selfies at the end of the video. Uh, a number of you sent those in, and it was a real blessing. You know, I have Facebook, and so I see a lot of faces, and so I didn't really think it would be that impacting for me. But seeing all those faces and seeing you, you smiling and seeing you doing okay really left an impact on me, and it was really a blessing. So I, I encourage you, if you haven't sent one in or if you want to send in another one to show that your family's still doing doing great. Uh, please uh, email that to the church office and we'll include that in the end of next week's video. As we continue, let's, um, let's begin in prayer. Our Father, we know that you are always with us. Um, we know that you are fully present with, in our homes, um, with each one of us, uh, and we know that we are connected through your blood as part of your body. We pray for healing in our world. Uh, we pray for those who are, who are sick as a result of this, this virus or, or uh, are not able to get all their needs met due to um, the, the strain on the healthcare system. Uh, there are just so many different, different needs. And God, we, we pray for healing of our land right now. And Father, we pray that you be with us during our time of worship. Help us all to, to lift our hearts up to you, to focus solely on you despite all the things going on around us, um, honoring that you're here present with us, and honoring you as the great creator of the world who deeply loves us. Help today to be a celebration of your love. Thank you again for Jesus, whose sacrifice gives us life. And it's in him we pray. Amen. Join me as we worship. Why don't you hold to his hand, to my God's unchanging hand? Why don't you hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand? You better build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Still more closely to him, please. 
So why don't you hold to his hand to God's unchanging hand? My brothers, hold to his hand to God's unchanging hand. You better build your hopes on things eternal. Don't you hold to God's unchanging hand when your journey is completed. Don't you hold to his hand, to my God's unchanging hand. My sisters hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. You better build your hopes on things eternal. Don't you hold to God's unchanging hand. Why don't you hold to his hand, to my God's unchanging hand. Why don't you hold to his hand? Unchanging hand, you better build your hopes on things eternal. Don't you hold to God's unchanging hand? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Many of us are thankful for their ministry there. 
and that we got to join them in bringing hope to Honduras. Well, on one of our youth group short-term summer mission trips to Honduras, we learned pretty quickly about two young individuals, Omam and Josue. <laughs> they were different. Uh, of the 24 children at Casa, Oman and Josue stood out to us, not only because they were the youngest, but because we learned something special about them. Check out those smiles for your first clue. Three people are smiling here. Why is that? Check out the shirt for your second clue. So, so, so love. Well, what's going on here? Yes, these two full of life young men would eat the same rice and beans as all the other children, play on the same playground, jump on the same trampoline. They slept beneath the same tin roof as all the other children and enjoyed listening to the pounding rain when it came. Their routine was identical to the other children. But how did we know their situation was special? Well, if you look at this picture closely, you might discover another clue about their special glow. You see that shared toy truck under Oman's arm? Ask yourself, what makes that gift a game changer for them? How could that gift make that big of a difference in what was going on inside of them that would energize them and cause them to be excited about each new day? It was just a simple gift. But what if it was more? Well, here's the rest of the story. That truck came from Stephanie Roden, and in her travels to Honduras, she had made a special connection with these two, and she had asked them if she could adopt them and take them home with her. She was to become their mom, and they would join her family. Wow. The process of adoption for her was to be a long journey and quite a few years. So if you ask them, they would tell you, Stephanie is coming for us. You see, her gift was not just toys for them to play with, but they were a reminder that they were special and that they belonged. These gifts, these tokens of love, convinced them to believe the incredible. Somebody knows their name, deeply cares about them, and has promised to take them home, home. So as a result, Oman and Josue are different. They still live in the same home, play on the same playground, eat the same dinner, but their world changed the day they learned that somebody far away knows their name, cares about them, and is coming for them. Might you be willing to believe the same as you take communion? Are you open to the idea that a father, a heavenly father, knows your name and has stepped out of heaven to bring his heaven, his love, down to earth to embrace you, to delight in you, and to adopt you? Do you really believe that Jesus sets his affection on you? Every detail about you he knows. Your interests, your hang-ups, your fears, your flaws, and even your failures, he knows you and he loves you. About his children, God says, for the Lord searches every heart and he understands every desire and every thought. First Chronicles 28, nine. Did you know God regards you as the apple of his eye according to Zechariah 2, eight? Do you know this God that knows you, loves you, and made the ultimate sacrifice so that you could be adopted into his family? <laughs> Imagine our delight when Stephanie finally got to bring her boys to live in her home and be fully with her. There was a party, there was a reception group at the airport ready to receive them and welcome them. And let me tell you, just like Oman and Josue, we have a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering for us and celebrating that we are a special part of God's family. We are loved, we are his children, and we are designed for his delight. This bread and fruit of the vine is Christ's gift to us. It is a token of his love 
to convince us to believe the incredible. As we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we are reminded that even though we are in this mess today, we're not of this mess. Before I lead us in a prayer for communion, I want to remind you of what Paul says in Colossians 2, 1 through 4. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. As we together reflect on his amazing love for us, may this bread and this cup help us to rise above the pull of this world and be drawn into his powerful presence. Would you pray with me? Dear Father, thank you for loving us, adopting us, and making us a special part of your family. Bless us as we eat this bread and drink from this cup so that we may celebrate your goodness and your love. May your delight in us fill us with your love so that your love flows through us and out of us into the people that we will share life with this week. In Jesus' name we pray. In all who agree with me, say amen. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for the rest of this. When we all get to heaven, what a day, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout and shout the victory. Seventeen to 24. From Miletus, Paul sent for the elders of the church at Ephesus. When they arrived, he spoke to them. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, he said. From the first day I came into Asia Minor, I served the Lord with tears and without pride. I served him when I was greatly tested. And I, I was tested by the evil plans of the Jews who disagreed with me. You know that nothing has kept me from preaching whatever would help you. I have taught you in public and from house to house. I have told both Jews and Greeks that they must turn away from their sins to God. They must have faith in our Lord Jesus. Now I am going to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit compels me. I don't know what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Spirit warns me. He tells me that I will face prison and suffering. But my life means nothing to me. My only goal is to finish the race. I want to complete the work the Lord Jesus has given me, 
He wants me to tell others about the good news of God's grace. Good morning, everyone. As we get started today, I was thinking about the Super Bowl. You know, I, I must have cut in last week thinking about sports, and so I'm still thinking about sports uh, and maybe in a little bit of denial right now. But uh, if you were all here with me, I would ask, who watched the Super Bowl this year? And um, the puppets aren't going to raise their hands, but, but a few of you might. And I might ask, how many watched the Super Bowl for the actual game? Or how many watched for the commercials? Right, because it's become this cultural phenomenon where people tune in to, to watch the, co the commercials. Companies put out their best ads, they put out their, their best marketing strategies, and they pay a lot of money to put these commercials on the air. There was one commercial that came out uh, a few years back uh, from, a, from an adult beverage company that was asking this question, are you up for whatever? So the premise was this, that a person would, would be at a party or something, and they would walk up with, with someone, a stranger would walk up with this drink and say, if I give you this, are you up for whatever? And then if they said yes, then they would end up on this wild adventure where they have llamas and an elevator and famous actors and athletes would, would run into them throughout the night. Uh, one ends up with this guy playing ping pong with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was just this crazy, wild adventure that they went on because the person said, yes, I'll be up for whatever comes next. So I want you to pause for a second as we think about commercials and talk amongst yourselves uh, with your family or those viewing with you. What's one of your favorite commercials? It doesn't have to be a Super Bowl commercial. Just what is one of your favorite commercials? And what did you like about it? And when you're done doing that, um, come, come back and we'll, we'll discuss a little further. So uh, ultimately, this ad campaign of are you up for whatever got the company in quite a bit of trouble, mainly because this idea of, of always saying yes can present a lot of risks and problems, right? If you erase no from the vocabulary, you can put yourself in a lot of danger. And, and that was something that, from a marketing perspective, they had to wash away and, and take on another campaign because you don't really want to write a blank check to anybody, right? I'm always gonna give you a yes. However, as I reflected on this idea, this is what we do as Christians, right? We, we write a blank check to God. And it may have been a check that we wrote when we were really, really young. But when we declared Jesus as Lord, we said, I'm going to be up for whatever. Wherever you send me, I'll go. Whatever you call me to, that's what I'm going to do. Now, most of the time, this is a blessing, right? There are good things that come from our obedience, Right? We find the ways that God wants us to live have all kinds of, of blessings and fruitfulness in our lives that we never would have anticipated. But sometimes there are certain moments when being obedient and being up for whatever he calls us to can seem more like a curse and can even be painful. He can call us to some difficult places. And that's something that we see here in the book of Acts. So we've been following the Apostle Paul as he makes his way throughout the word sharing the gospel. And last week we were in Ephesus and talked about the, the dramatic encounter there where Christianity was challenging the, the systems of the world and the world was getting scared. Paul's run out of town and it, it tells us in the text that he knew that he needed to go to Jerusalem and he had a sense that he was going to face some difficult things there. So he actually makes his way back uh, after leaving and going up through Macedonia. He comes back through and stops at Miletus, where he visits with the Ephesian elders, uh, which was the passage that we just read uh, during the scripture reading. And he tells them there, I know I've got to go to Jerusalem, and I know troubles await me there. So Paul makes his way from there. He moves on from that encounter with, with them and the prayer that they have together. And they come all the way down here to Tyre. 
So they're up here. This is modern day Turkey, and they're making their way back over here to Israel. Uh, from there, and in the text that we'll look at today, he's going to go from Tyre all the way to Jerusalem, and we'll, we'll see some things that happen uh, during this time. So if you look with me in your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in chapter 21, and starting in verse 3. And so it says, After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where a ship was told was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and they returned home. So in this text, Paul and his companions are in Tyre, and the Spirit has made it very clear that there are going to be some difficult things that happen. Now, there, for everything that we see coming up, there's going to be some interesting allusions to and comparisons to Jesus and his journey to Jerusalem, the, the ways that he knew he was going to have to face hardship, the way that his uh, friends and companions told him not to go to find another way, and yet he went in full obedience. Uh, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, is, is making sure you see those, those comparisons, which is a great study for, for another time, but it, it, you can feel it as the text moves Paul over to Jerusalem. And here, as he's in Tyre, the Spirit is making it clear to the people there that Paul on his journey is going to have some very difficult times. And so they urge him and they beg him, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't do this. And he says, nope, I've got to keep going. And so they meet on the beach and they pray together and he continues on. And so they go from there to Caesarea. And here in Caesarea, it says this, starting in verse 8 of chapter 21. It says, Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So here he says, again, he's getting this message that terrible things are going to happen. Uh, first, Philip's daughters who prophesy, who prophesy, likely were telling him more about what he's going to face, right? Like this message seems to be consistently coming in this chapter from the Spirit to tell Paul there are hardships coming. The church is getting ready for something really difficult to happen to Paul. So it's likely he heard that from, from them as they prophesied. And then Agabus comes. Agabus was uh, mentioned earlier in the chapter, because, or earlier in the book of Acts, because he predicts a great famine that comes through uh, this, the region of Judea. Uh, and Agabus stands up and he binds his hands and his feet and he says, the Holy Spirit's saying this is the way that the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem are going to bind the owner of this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. Now, after this, after they've heard all of this, and Luke has written himself into the story, right? He stopped using they and them and just naming people to saying we, right? We did this. We went to these places. Luke is an intricate part to everything that happens from here on out. And he says, when we heard this, when we heard this prophecy of Agabus, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, he gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. And after this, we started on our way to Jerusalem. So the companions are begging Paul, don't do this. And this is Luke saying, I begged him. I said to Paul, don't go, right? He's writing this down and he's saying, I told Paul, please don't do this. But Paul doesn't give him an inch. In fact, he says, why are you breaking my heart? I'm not only ready to be bound, I'm not only ready to get thrown in prison 
and jail and beaten like I've already experienced, but I'm also ready to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul is up for whatever in result of following Jesus. Now, I think there are a couple things that we learn from this passage. And the first that jumps out is this. It's that others will not always understand. See, I, I thought uh, growing up that when I, when I heard these stories of, of adventure and the good guys doing the right thing, that somehow they, they always knew exactly what they were supposed to do. Right? The, the path was really clear. There was right, there was wrong, there was good, there was bad. And they had in their mind the one path that they needed to go. And real life is much messier than that, right? And, and it seemed like other people knew that too, right? Even if they were, were fighting against what was right, they knew that they were fighting against what's right. Um, but the real world has a lot more tension as we try to sort through what is the right thing. And what does it mean to truly follow Jesus with everything? I... Uh, I had this friend who was wrestling through a decision to go into ministry. And he, uh, he was actually working on um, getting a job somewhere and, and, and talking to a church. And his parents came in the side door and said, you're not going to do this. And they, they stopped him from moving in that direction. Now, if they were able to stop him, it, it, might, it was probably not the right thing for him. But in their mind, him taking on a job where he wasn't going to make a lot of money, he wasn't going to have the job security that they had hoped for. They, they were Christian people, but they would rather him not be that kind of Christian. Now, everybody shouldn't go into ministry. Everybody shouldn't give their life in that way. But in this guy's case... He was trying to follow Jesus, and the people around him, the people he trusted most, didn't fully understand. There's often times like that, that if we're going to do what's right, right, if we're going to follow Jesus in the ways that he calls us, not apart from, from right and wrong, if we're going to go in the ways that the Spirit is leading us, other people might not always agree with us or appreciate what we're trying to do, and we may feel very alone. I'm sure Paul felt very alone as he argued consistently with his friends. No, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> Stop breaking my heart. I've got to follow Jesus, even if it takes me to hardship in Jerusalem. And the next thing that we see here is this. Paul is following God regardless of the outcome. Paul is not connected to how things turn out. He's only connected to being obedient in the moment. And for this moment, it means going to Jerusalem and facing whatever's there. He doesn't know the end of the story. He doesn't know how things are going to ultimately work out. He doesn't get out his Bible and open up to the book of Acts and thumb through to the back and see, how is this going to happen for me? He doesn't know. All he knows is that he gave his life to Jesus. And that means he has to be up for whatever, even if it means hardship and prison and death. So how does he do that without knowing? He remembered the commitment that he'd made and the faithful God that he made that commitment to. As I was thinking through this and some, some real life examples, I, I thought of this man, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a, a seminary teacher in Germany before World War II and, and throughout uh, World War II. He, uh, he wrote a, a very important book, a, one that's important in my life, called The, the Cost of Discipleship. And as the, the Nazi party was gaining momentum, he was speaking out uh, against their, their warlike practices. And he found himself in some difficult situations. Um, one of them being that 
Once the war began, or it looked like war was going to start, as a relatively young man, he was going to have to decide if they conscripted him, if he was going to, to fight for the Nazis, which he knew he couldn't do. He knew he couldn't swear an oath to Hitler. But he also knew that, that if he spoke out against the Nazis, that, that he could face death and he could cause trouble for his fellow Christians. So he's given this opportunity to uh, go to America, right? And he goes to uh, America and spends a few years working with a seminary there. But he regrets this decision. And he says this. He says, I've come to the conclusion that I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our, natural, in our national history with the people of Germany. I'll have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I don't share in the trials of this time with my people. And so... Um, he, he, he continues, he says, Christians in Germany will have to face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive or willing the victory of their nation and thereby destroying civilization. I know which of these alternatives I must choose, but I cannot make that choice from security. He can't make that choice being in America. And so on the last steamer that was making its way across the Atlantic before the war began, he was on it. And he returned to Germany. And throughout those years of the war, he encouraged Christians. He taught. Um, he actually has kind of a, 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 a spy adventure that, that, ta- that he becomes a, a part of. But for the most part, he tries to preach the gospel and ultimately He's executed by the Nazis one month before they surrender. His book, The Cost of Discipleship, is, is lessons on from the Sermon of the Mount. And one of the most powerful components of that book is where he talks about cheap or costly grace. And he says, we all, people often want cheap grace that costs nothing, but real grace costs everything. And when you realize that he was a man who willingly went into a hardship and eventually death, knowing what he would face against one of the most evil empires that the modern world has seen, it makes his words in that book all that more significant. In fact, I'll be honest, as I've worked through that book multiple times, it sat on my desk for years and I've never finished the whole thing. I'll read uh, a long ways into it, and sometimes I get, get further, but ultimately, his words are so strong and so convicting, I'm not able to finish it all the way. Paul knew he was going to face hardship in Jerusalem. He knew the possibility of death was there, but he went anyway. Listen to what happens to him. And there's a setup for this. There's uh, some companions that come with him. And people think that these Gentiles are going into the temple. And there's some confusion. Ultimately, they just leverage a bad a situation in order to finally take down Paul. The Jewish leaders have had enough of this missionary. And so it says as the conflict came up, it says the whole city was aroused. And the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him in front of the, from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. And while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took, took some of his officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the riders saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. And when Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. So, 
Paul gets dragged away and beaten. People are arguing about why he deserves this, right? When, they, when the guard asks, Who, what did he do? Nobody can agree. They just all want him dead. It looks very much like when Jesus was arrested. And this was off probably very painful for Paul on a personal level. Remember, he, he spent a great deal of time in Jerusalem. Some of these dragging him or trying to kill him were likely people he knew or had met. Maybe before his conversion were people that had been his friends. And yet now they're trying to get rid of him in an angry and violent way. But you know... This isn't the end of his story. See, he'll be, he'll be pulled into several different political situations. He'll be pulled into several different courtrooms. And he'll have the opportunity to share his testimony in front of some large groups of people. He'll be able to share his testimony to some very important people in the empire. In fact, due to his arrest, he'll, give, he'll be given the opportunity to appeal his case to Caesar. He's going to get a chance to tell about what Jesus did in his life to the ruler of the Roman Empire. And as the book of Acts comes to an end and he's guarded by soldiers and protected from all those that are looking to do him harm, so he has this opportunity to serve as a witness. Paul sees that if he trusts God, God will then do great things through him. But in the moment, it may not have seemed like that. As he's traveling down to Jerusalem, as he's getting arrested, he trusts God and all he knows is that he's supposed to do what God put in front of him. The ending is great. But being in the middle of the story is hard. One of my favorite series, both movie and uh, book series, is The Lord of the Rings. And one of my favorite quotes that shows up is, is from the character Samwise Gamgee. And he's commenting on this journey that they're in and wondering if they're going to make it. And he talks about the heroes of old and the legends. And Frodo's asking him, that, do you think they'll tell stories about us? And he says this, he says, folks seem to have just landed in adventures usually. Their paths were laid out that way. But I expect they had lots of chances like us of turning back. Only they didn't. And if they had, we shouldn't know because they'd have been forgotten. Right? He, he says, these great heroes probably had lots of opportunities to say, no, I'm not up for whatever. But they say yes, and they become legends because of the way that their story concludes. Paul had a chance to speak to Caesar. Bonhoeffer's words have incredible significance because we know they come from an authentic and true source. Right? And when he talks about paying the price of being a follower of Jesus, you listen. Because he was willing to pay every price. Look, this whole idea may seem a little abstract, right? Like, it, it's one thing to imagine Paul being told by the Spirit he needed to go to Jerusalem. And you may be thinking, I'm not told to go to another city where I may face hardship. Maybe there's not a specific challenge that's in front of you that you know you have to do. But I'll guarantee you this, if you're following Jesus, that will certainly come one day. It, it may not be a physical place, but it might be. <laughs> I, I, I never thought that I might be called to live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and yet here I am after 16 years. God may call you to another country. But he also may call you to a higher sense of, of purity. He may call you to a new career. 
He may call you to acts of service that you never thought you'd be willing to do. He may, he may challenge you in your relationships. Maybe it's, it's that you need to end one that's unhealthy. Or maybe he calls you to stick with one that's, that's struggling. I don't know what it might be. But he asks us to trust him and be up for whatever in the moment. You may need courage for your journey now. There's no promises that everything works out great for you. Right? Bonhoeffer eventually was executed right at the end of the war. But God used his story. And God's used Paul's story. And I believe God will use your story. I don't, I don't think he, he forces hardship on us. Right? He's not the one that, that brings the, the torture to us. It's the, it's the brokenness of this world. But I also don't think that he lets it go to waste. As he weaves our story into his great, beautiful story. So I encourage you, trust in the Lord and don't turn back now. We'll have a closing now from one of our shepherds, Daryl Sanderson. As we close this morning, I'd like to close with a scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you.